Luke 22 and 1. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. So he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he promised and sought opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of the multitude. Now the death of Jesus had occurred around the Passover time. Uh, the annual celebration of the time of the lambs had been slain in Egypt. That's when they slayed the lambs. Oh, imagine that. Here comes the Lamb of God. He's going to be slain when? Passover. Isn't that something? God spared the Israelites at Passover, but punished the Egyptians. Now the religious leaders were afraid of the people because they were following Jesus. They were afraid of them. Now remember the question about that coin. When they said, whose coin is this? They asked Jesus with that question, designed to trap him. They wanted to find a way to get the people mad at him so that they could arrest him in such a way that wouldn't get the people mad at them. They wanted to keep the people at bay because they made money off of them. They needed these people to like them. They used these people, the people, to fatten their wallets. So they tried to develop that coin trick to get Jesus to answer a question. Uh, and, and also in, that, in understanding this is that when you love money, you despise God. Americans always get hurt when you say that. When you love money, you despise God. You cannot serve both. And so when Satan entered Judas, he was willing to betray Jesus for money. You know, like I said, if you love money, then walking away from Jesus is no problem. And this is especially tough on us men. We're really bad about this. The man thought process, maybe some of you women too, but I'm speaking on behalf of the guys. We're notorious for this. We think like this. If I could just make a little more money, I could fix my problems. That's what we do. Just a little bit more money and I can fix everything. And then we try to scratch and claw our way up there. We can't quite get it. And if we do get up there, we just get, what, more problems. Okay? It just doesn't end. If you love God, you'll have no problem being a giver of money and releasing money. But if you love your money, you'll have no problem walking away from Jesus Christ. That's the Bible. Satan is taking part in Jesus' death here. It's actually part of his own downfall. Because through dying, Jesus conquered death. And like I said, Satan went into that blind rage situation here. In Hebrews 2 and 14, it says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. This is bad for Satan. Now, you might recall in Luke 13, 31, he was headed to uh, Jerusalem. The Pharisees said, get out of here. Herod wants to kill you. Don't go to Jerusalem. Herod's after you. But Jesus responded by saying he was going to continue his journey to Jerusalem. For it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. Prophets need to die inside of Jerusalem. Now, I'm thinking of this event like I was talking about. Satan was trying to keep Jesus from the cross. Satan knows the prophecies about Jesus going to die on the cross. But now here, Satan has entered into Judas and is going to betray Jesus and actually help in Jesus' prosecution towards putting him to death. Interesting concept here. So, it's like I said, he goes into that blind rage. He, he just loses his temper. He's going to get Jesus in this situation where he's arrested and betrayed, and then he's going to have Jesus beat. Now, we got to remember, uh, God's Word is infallible, it is inerrant, meaning it has no errors, it has no contradictions in it. And if you think you see one, oh, that's a contradiction right there. I'll tell you where the contradiction's at. The contradiction is right here. It's not in the pages, it's in your head. And I promise you, if you will give it some honest research and read into it and see what's there, you'll find out, oh, that's how it worked, there's no contradiction at all. So... Like I was saying, if on one hand you don't understand why was Satan trying to keep Jesus from Jerusalem, but now on the other hand he's wanting to kill him, 
the understanding in that is that Satan went to, into blind rage, and now he wants to do as much damage to the Son of God as he can. It's not a contradiction. All it takes is a little bit of study and context. You know, I have bet my, in, I, I have pushed all my chips in. And I have put my eternal destiny on the fact that the Word of God is true. You know, if, if I can't trust part of it, I can't trust any of it. And so the Word of God is true. So as we read, why is he trying to kill him here and prevent him from going there? Well, that's not a problem in the Scripture. That's a problem with Satan. He doesn't make sense sometimes, all right? Sometimes I don't make sense, all right? <laughs> but anyway, that's just something I wanted to convey. Um, I have bet my eternal destiny that the Word of God is true. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He absolutely is. And amen to that. Luke 22 and verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat. So they said to him, Where do you want us to prepare? And he said to them, Behold, which means look, Look, when you have entered a city, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. Then you shall say to the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished upper room. There make ready. So they went and found it just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. Even, you know, even as Jesus was about to be killed, wow, look at this. He's about to be killed. He's still doing miraculous things. He told Peter and John exactly what they would find when they went about the preparations of the Passover. It kind of reminds me when he told them to go find that colt to ride into Jerusalem on. Go over here. There's going to be a colt. Ask the guy that say, hey, hey, look, the Lord needs it. And there's the colt. That's what we're going to do. You know, um, Jesus just knows. He's the Messiah. He's God in flesh. That's what's amazing. Now, it would have been easy, it would have been very easy to recognize a man carrying water in this day and age. Why? Because it was usually the women were the ones who usually went to fetch water for their households. You may remember the, 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 the Samaritan woman at the well. She was there to get water. That's what the women did. It was part of their household duties. So he goes, Go out and look, you'll find a man carrying water. Well, that's not going to be hard to find. We'll see him easy. So they were then to go with him and tell the owner that the teacher needed to use the guest room to eat the Passover. You know, it only leads me to think that the owner of this house must have been a believer also to be able to receive this from the disciples, to just show up like that. Teacher needs to use your house. Okay, come in. I mean, you've got to think that this man had to somewhat be preconditioned as a believer through the Holy Spirit, Right? It makes you wonder, what miracle did Jesus give to this owner beforehand, before the disciples showed up? Was it uh, in a dream, or did a messenger come and tell him to do this? Hey, you're going to have some disciples show up tomorrow when you're carrying water, and they're going to need to use your house. I, I don't know, it just, makes me, it just makes me think about these kind of things. But whatever the case, it's awesome to see how God works among other people. Other people, and you know what? He still operates like that today. He still does that right now. As you go through the journey of your life, of a disciple of Jesus, God is able to put other believers in your path who will help you with the call that God has put on your life. You may be thinking right now, I don't know how I'm going to do this thing that I have to do. I have no idea. And then all of a sudden you'll bump into somebody or, or a series of people that God has placed there and He's communicated to them when that guy with the blue shirt shows up, I want you to tell him this and, and such things. And I've, I've been through situations like that before. And it's amazing. It's miraculous. And these things do happen. So don't feel like you're just walking alone through, through life. Well, Ray, I feel fine when I'm here at church. When I go to work, that's just me by myself. I'm all alone. No, you're not. God has other people everywhere. And he will send them to help you. Way back when I wasn't even aware of my calling, God put a lot of people in my path, lots of people. And people that I knew, and some of them were people that I didn't know. And they helped and provide me with things I needed along the way that got me to the ministry that I'm doing now here at Calvary Chapel Pearland. 
God's people will continue to help me in the future, and I'll be able to help others in God's will too. Same goes for all of us. I can't stress it enough. I just cannot stress it enough how important it is to be plugged into the body of Christ, however big or however small it is. Plug into the body of Christ. You need the fellowship. And not just you, but the people you know are going to need it from you too. You know, if you, I've always heard this, that if you remove a red hot coal from a burning lump of coals, what happens? That coal goes cold. And I tried that the other day. We had a fire pit in the backyard when uh, Stevie and Emma were getting married. We had a little party for them. And I had all those coals going. I was trying to keep the fire hot. And I'm like, I know it'll do it, but I just want to watch it. <laughs> so I reached in there with the tongs and I took a nice red hot piece of coal. I mean, that sucker was going. I took it and I set it off to itself in the fire pit and the rest of them, the big, the bunches of coals, they kept burning and burning and burning. And that lone coal, what did it do? Went out. It went right out. You got to be plugged into the body of Christ. You got to be in the body of Christ. My friend is a fireman. He went through Bible college with me and he was uh, talking about something I, I don't remember what it was. It's something I did here. And he goes, oh, Ray, you've been putting out fires in the ministry? I said, at my church, we don't put fires out. We start them, you know. And he thought it was, he laughed at that. So anyway, but there's too many Christians who are not involved with the body of Christ. They think it's enough to just go, Jesus, Lord, thank you, and pray before meals. And they think that's it. They think that's all they got to do. You know what? If you're not obeying Jesus, is he your Lord? Jesus asked that question. Why do you call me Lord and you don't do the things I tell you to? We've got to be doing the things he said to do. Too many Christians are not involved with the body of Christ. They wonder why they have the problems that they have. I can't tell you how many people call me on the phone or email or whatever. Oh, Ray, this is going on. Why is this happening? The first thing I want to say is, well, hang on a second. Where have you been the last four weeks? Haven't seen you. You want to come over to my house and we'll stand around the fire pit and talk a little bit? <laughs> I'll show you something. I'll pull that coal off and show you where you are. Be in the Word. Abide in Jesus. Be in the fellowship. And you will have help in the journey of your life. That's what's going on with the disciples here is going to see this man. I want to show you in John 8, 31. It's a very pivotal passage for me that really helped change me when I was undergoing my change in the Lord. John 8, 31, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, who believed him, if, that's an if, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. If what? If you abide in my word. I know everybody knows John 3, 16. I know that everybody knows David, uh, David killed a um, Goliath. Noah floated on a boat. Jesus died on a cross. Eh, I'm a Christian. He says, abide in the Word. Abide means you've got to stay there. Live in it. Eat it. Breathe it. Abide. Then you are my disciples. I used to be one of those non-reading Christians. I didn't have a clue of righteousness from a hole in the ground. And my life was full of a mess. I had no testimony because I couldn't show anybody who Jesus was because there was no victory in my life. Abide in the Word, you'll be my disciple, he said. Do you want to be a true believer? Abide in His Word. It means you don't just pick it up on Sunday for a short read. You live it. It becomes like air. You have to have it in order to go on. So like I said, if you want to be provided for like these disciples are, then abide in His Word. Now some people, they try to make up for God's Word with money, like I was saying about us men. They try to make it up with, with, with uh, money. Well, I can fix all this stuff with more money. Money can't provide you things that the Lord can. It can't. I want to live like these disciples here. I want to know that as I go along in my life, that God is going to have my needs met. And when God meets your needs, He does it for free. Quit saying, if I just made more money, I could fix it. God will do it for nothing. That's a way to save money anyway. <laughs> so it's a good way to live. Luke 22 and 14. So they have a place to go now. <clears throat> Luke 22 and 14. When the hour had come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. 
For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. Now, about this covenant stuff here, uh, the new covenant, Jesus taught that his death would mean the beginning of the new covenant, the new covenant. The old covenant that God had established, it required obedience to the law of Moses, to the law of Moses. Now, the prophet Jeremiah, he had predicted there'd be a time when God would make a new covenant with the nation of Israel. And I want to show you that because that's what Jesus is instituting here is the new covenant. Way back in Jeremiah 31, in verse 31, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, Jesus came to fulfill the law of Moses, not abolish it. That's what a lot of the Jews misunderstood. They thought he was trying to get rid of the law. That's what made him mad. He wasn't there to get rid of it. He was there to fulfill it in him. Now, the law had required animal sacrifice for covering of sins. Um, But with the new covenant, Jesus spilled his own blood as our ultimate sacrifice, not just to cover our sins up, but to take them away. Now, remember what John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus. He said, behold, the Lamb of God who covers. No, that's not what he said. And I saw some of y'all's lips going and y'all went like, what did he just say? (laughs) Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. They're gone. They're not covered. I remember one time I was told, hey, would you sweep up the floor? And I didn't want to take it out. You've done it. Come on, don't look. You sweep it under the rug, right? You lay that rug down and nobody will find that. Don't look at me like that. You've done it. Come on. Anyway, that's kind of the difference. He didn't just sweep it under the rug where it was still there. He actually got rid of it. He took the garbage out. It's gone. That's what's neat about being forgiven in Jesus Christ is that it is out of here. Now, the old covenant was written in stone, but the new covenant is written on our hearts, in our inner man. I want you to notice in Luke, in Luke 22, verse 20, Jesus takes the cup and he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Now that we are under the new covenant, we are not under the penalty of law. We are now given the opportunity to, re, to receive salvation as a free gift in grace, in grace. Hebrews 9 and 15. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. That means you get saved now. That means you get saved. Y'all remember back in Luke 16, I'm going to take a brief detour. You remember Luke 16, Jesus told the thief, um, no, let me back up. In Luke 16, we read about Lazarus and the rich man. They went to a place, there's a place of torment over here, there's a place of comfort over here, and it was divided by a deep chasm, and they could actually talk to each other. Okay, that's where believers and unbelievers went before Jesus died. Okay, they had to wait. They couldn't go straight to the Father. And I skipped ahead when I said, Jesus told the thief on the cross, when will you be in paradise with me? He said, today. He goes, today you're going to be with me in paradise. So if Jesus died and took with him the thief to paradise that day, but then skip one, two, three days later, he rises from the grave. Mary Magdalene sees him. She goes to grab him and he goes, don't touch me. Don't hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. 
I saw a problem in that timeline. Well, where have you been for three days if it wasn't with the Father? It was down in that place of paradise where the rich man was in the flame, okay? So that was what happened in the Old Covenant. The sin wasn't gone yet, it was just under the rug. So the people were held, the believers were held in a place where, um, a place of comfort, but even they still had to wait for Jesus Christ to come and die on the cross to make the way straight to the Father. If I showed up at your house with mud up to my neck, you would not let me in. If you're having a big party and everybody was here and I looked in the door and I said, well, you let them in. You're like, yeah, they're clean. You can't come in. I want you to come in. Well, do you not love me? I mean, they're in, so let me in. Yeah, whoa, 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 hang on. I love you, but you can't come in like that. You got to get cleaned up. You get cleaned up, yeah, you can come on in. If you ain't got a way to get cleaned up, I'll give you a way to get cleaned up. And that's what God said to us. I want you here, but you can't come in with that sin all over you. So they had to wait until Jesus went to the cross. Then they had a way to get cleaned up. Then they could go to the, the Father in heaven. So that was kind of a, that's my little spin on Old Covenant, New Covenant. Now under the New Covenant, we've had the Lamb of God who takes away, not covers up, takes away the sins of the world. Now when we perish, we get to go straight on. How cool is that? I think that's pretty neat. So anyway, back to my notes again. <laughs> so eternal inheritance it's talking about. That's eternal life. Now the bread, he said, the bread and the fruit of the vine he's talking about was given to show that Jesus' body and blood were necessary to institute the new covenant, this new covenant that we're under. Jesus' final teaching about the kingdom occurred at this Passover feast here. And it's awesome to think about what Passover is. Passover um, is while Israel was afflicted in Egypt, those who had the blood of the Passover lamb on the doorpost, they painted it around on the doorpost, they did not they did not have death put upon death did not come into their house they were protected the lord it he passed over that that's why it's called passover death passed over those who had the blood on their doors today the lamb of god who is jesus is on the doorpost of my heart and so the penalty of eternal death passes over me and likewise, if you believe in Jesus as your Lord, it passes over you because you've got the blood of Christ on you. Passes over you. I've got the blood of Christ on me. My sins have been taken away. They're not just swept under a rug. They're gone. Awesome. Praise God. Now, Jesus announced this was the last Passover. That he would eat with them until all that it means would find fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Now, many events in the Old Testament, including the Passover, it pointed towards Jesus' ministry. It pointed that direction towards Him. <clears throat> and I do this every time. I always lose my spot. Um, he preached the things that Jesus preached about. The Passover pointed directly at Jesus Christ. When His kingdom would arrive, the Passover would be filled, for God would have brought His people safely into their rest. I'm in the rest of Jesus Christ. I have talked with pastors that have churches a whole lot bigger than this one. And I had asked them before, doesn't it kind of weigh on you a little bit? Doesn't it kind of get to be big? And some of them had said, yeah, oh yeah. And then one of them says, no, it doesn't. Huge church. And I said, well, how come? He goes, I realize it's not me that runs it. He says, I'm not the one that runs it. It's the Lord's church. It ain't my church. And so he taught me a lot about entering into the Lord's rest and, you know, I think in our own lives, we need to learn that too. The Lord has rest for you. Do you feel like you just don't get any rest? I don't mean going to sleep at night. I'm talking about overall in life. Do you need rest? If you just feel like I just don't get any rest, oh, and you're just always uptight, you need to let it go to the Lord because He took that on the cross for you. Let it go. Enter into His rest. Israel entered into God's rest. He brought the Israelites out of Egypt and into their own land. They entered into His rest. And so let's remember our God of comfort. Enter into His rest. Let go of that frustration. Well, Ray, how's it supposed to... My problems, how do they get done if I'm not tending to it? Well, maybe that's the problem. You've been trying to tend to it and you can't do it. You haven't let the Lord take it yet. Let Him do it. 
I guarantee you, he'll show you something in that. And so Jesus here, he's now having good fellowship with those who believed in him as the Messiah. And to think that after this long, long journey, this long ministry of three years, so many people rejected him as the Messiah. You're not the Messiah. Prove it. On what basis, what authority do you have to say this or do this? He'd been having all that all this time. Now he's just having a Passover, good fellowship, and the rest of God with them, that they recognize him as the Messiah. He's having fellowship with those who accepted him, except for one guy. Except for one guy. Oh, it's always got to be one, doesn't it? Here we go. Luke 22 and 21. He says, but behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table, on, on the table. And truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to question among themselves which one of them it was who would do this thing. Imagine being at the table here among this twelve. One of you is about to betray me. The first thing you're going to think of is, what am I doing? What have I done? I'm trying to think back over the things I've been doing. What have I, you know... It's like when I'm talking to people in a restaurant. And they go, oh, so what do you do? I go, I'm a pastor. And they go, they get all quiet and they're like, I can see their, the gears turning in their head. They're like, what are, what, what are the words I said to him the last 20 minutes? Did I cuss? Did I say anything bad? And I just find it hilarious. I just laugh. But man, what if he said this and you were there? There's not that many guys. There's only 12. To hear that someone president will betray him. What's interesting here is that Judas's accountability... And God's sovereign plan, now hang on to this, this gets deep. Judas' accountability and God's sovereign plan for Jesus' death are seen here together in the same event. In the same event. Notice verse 22. It says that Jesus had to die as it had been determined. Right? That means it's going to happen. It's going to go down like this. Okay? And so it was foretold long ago, prophesied that Jesus would have to die. This was something that had to go down because his death on the cross is the basis of salvation for all mankind. It's going to happen. However, people often try, they want to feel sorry for Judas. They want to try to make an excuse for him saying that he was made to betray Jesus in order for all this stuff to go down. Like Judas was, I feel bad for him. He was mistreated. He had to do this to Jesus so that all the prophecy would go down. Oh, no, wait a minute. It's like people think God forced Judas to fall into betraying Jesus so that this prophecy would kick on. People treat Judas like he had no choice in the matter, like he was bound to prophecy only. Jesus had to go to the cross, and Jesus, therefore, was going to betray him for it is what they think. That's not the, that's not the case. Jesus said in verse 22, it says, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Woe. That means lots of misery and distress. Judas was still accountable for his own actions. He was accountable for himself. In fact, later, the 11, they had to choose a replacement for Judas, and they said in Acts 1 and 24, it says, and they prayed and said, you, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. Judas by transgression fell. Judas fell in sin. That was his choice to do it. You know, we are all accountable for our own sins. We are all accountable for what we do. Some people say, oh no, God ordained that to go down. God, he does ordain things, but that doesn't free you from the fact that you choose what you do. And it's hard to put that together. Well, if God's so in absolute control of everything, then that means I'm made to do things. No, you still have what's called free will, okay? I don't know how to make these two arguments meet in the middle. I, it's, it's hard. I just have to accept the fact sometimes God is infinite and I'm finite, okay? But... If you read the scriptures, we see Jesus was prophesied. He was going to go to the cross, and Judas fell by transgression. He was, he was accountable for himself. Nobody can ever say the devil made me do it. You ever heard that? devil made me do it. 
Yes, Satan had entered into Judas. It says so. But here in Acts 1, it says Judas fell by transgression, which is sin. Judas chose. Judas chose. He chose this. Judas was never a believer in Jesus as the Messiah. Even um, Judas was never a believer in Jesus as the Messiah, even though he was among the twelve. He was among the twelve. He never believed. And way back before all this come down, before we're at Luke 22, way, way back, Jesus said in John 6 and 70, I don't think I have it on the slide, but he said in John 6, 70, very early in his ministry, he said that one of you guys is a devil. He said that from the start. One of you is a devil. It's not like nobody knew. Jesus knew before. So interesting there. Now, being among the twelve did not make Judas saved. Some people think Judas was saved because he was a disciple. No, it's still the same rules. You still have to accept Jesus as the Messiah. Make him Lord. Repent of your sin. You've got to obey him. All these things to be saved. <clears throat> it's like people saying, um, you know, he was one of the twelve, so Judas was saved. Well, you know, going to church don't make you saved either. I, I'm well aware that there could be people in this room that think they're saved and they're not. I, when I was teaching at uh, a former church before, I was teaching, this one guy came up to me. He was always there. He was always among everybody. I could have sworn this guy was saved because he said all the right stuff. He always showed up. He was always involved. And one day he came to me and said, I cannot take this anymore. I'm living a lie, and I cannot deal with this anymore. It hurts too much. And I said, what's the matter? He goes, I want to get saved, and I don't know how. And the first thing that hit me was, you don't know how? Of all the times I've told you, you don't know how? And I led him to the Lord that night, but God dealt with me hard on this, on this night. He says, Ray, he goes, from now on, Whenever you preach or teach or anything, always teach the gospel like somebody in the room is not saved. Never water it down. Preach like somebody in the room is lost because you don't know. And everybody's like, why did he just look at me when he said that? <laughs> I usually do my scan. <laughs> Let me look at the ceiling dial. Preach like somebody in the room is not saved. Okay, so that's why I lay it down like I do. I don't know where you are. I may know you well as a person, and there may be people that are living with that mask on that, I, that have me totally fooled, but you know what? Doesn't matter. I'm going to put the gospel down in front of you like maybe you're not. You cannot be, you cannot go to eternal life. You cannot enter the kingdom of God unless Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. That means He's the boss. It means you do what He says. That means you have to give up your life the way you would like to have it and start doing what He tells you, even if it doesn't make sense. That's being saved. Well, I might lose all my friends. I might lose all my money. I might lose the stuff I want to keep. Well, all right, that's fine. What does that hold a candle to against eternal life anyway? Do what the Lord says. Judas was one of the 12 disciples that did not save him. Only Jesus saves if there's nothing else you hear tonight, hear this. Only Jesus saves. Only Jesus saves. Mm, on you, man. Okay? Y'all got that? <laughs> I want to show you something interesting in Luke 9.1. Now, this, this will really get you. Then he called his 11. What does it say? 12. He called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. Think about it. Jesus gave power and authority to a man who would never believe in him. You ever seen that? He gave power and authority to somebody, Judas, who would never believe in him. It says 12. Power and authority, authority over all demons and cure diseases. Now imagine an unbeliever who would never be saved, having power given to him by the Lord over demons and diseases. That's quite a thought. Today, people think that if they have this authority, or if they see someone out there doing something like this kind of authority, then surely they have to be saved. Look what they're doing. They have some kind of authority doing all this stuff. They've got to be saved. Now, I want to show you Matthew 7, 21. 
And this ought to, forgive the terminology, this ought to scare the hell out of you. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name. You see that? And done many wonders in your name. Hey, Lord, we did all this stuff. We have to be saved. This is where Judas was. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Some of your Bible versions may say iniquity in place of lawlessness. It's the same thing. It's sin. It's sin. He said, depart from me. He says, I don't know you. A lot of people think, well, I know Jesus. I'm saved. Yeah? I know the President of the United States, too. I mean, I know who Barack Obama is. If he walked in the room, I'd go, hey, that's Barack Obama. But I can't go to the White House and say, I'm here to see the president. Well, you're not on the list. So, I know him. They'll say, but he don't know you. You can't come in. Jesus says that he has to know you. It's not you knowing him, it's him knowing you. Which means you got to let him in. Okay? So here's Judas. He knows Jesus. Jesus don't know him. I mean, he knows him to the extent of a betrayer, but he did not submit to Jesus as Lord and Savior. So you got this guy. Here's Judas, a man who had once been given power and authority over demons and healing, but he is practicing lawlessness by betraying Jesus. Wow. Some people ask Ray, how can you biblically prove that Judas was an unbeliever? Well, duh, he he betrayed Jesus. What more do you need? I can show you plenty. But that ought to set off a few alarms. He set off Jesus, don't you think? If, if that's not the actions of an unbeliever, then I don't know what is. Jesus said he was a devil. That ought to give you another clue. But remember also, and now this comes back to an applying to us. Jesus said you cannot, cannot serve both God and mammon. Mammon is money and everything that it buys. You cannot serve both God and mammon. And what did Judas get for betraying Jesus? Money. Who did he really serve? Wasn't God. He served money. He did this to gain 30 pieces of silver, I believe. Judas wanted money. He did not want Jesus. He used Jesus as an opportunity. Jesus said you can't serve both God and money. You will love one and despise the other. So therefore, if Judas loved money, that means he despised Jesus Christ. And the same goes for us here in America. All of you who think you're going to heaven, but your true desire, if it's in money, I'm telling you, you're in just as much trouble as Judas is here. And just as willing to turn on Jesus as Judas did. If you love money, you will turn on Jesus for the first amount of money you can make in a heartbeat. Why? Because his God was money. Now, I could go all night on that subject, but man, i got to move on. Christian, God is to be your God, not your money. Don't act like Judas did here. Again, for us men, if I could just get a little more money, I could fix my problems. Oh, God, I pray you drop that way of thinking real quick. Repent of that fast. That'll lead you down a bad, bad path because as soon as you get this big opportunity, you will walk so far from righteousness, it'll be a wonder we ever get you back. Okay? As Jesus said in verse 22, woe to him. Judas was responsible for his own actions. We are responsible for our own actions as well. You are responsible for your own sins that you commit. And if you're saved, then you're... If you're saved, then you were even responsible for repenting and accepting Jesus' gift of salvation in order to be saved. Salvation is not automatic. I can't tell you how many people think salvation's automatic. Everybody thinks they're going to heaven. 
They're out there getting drunk, doing drugs, doing all the things they do. Jesus is not their Lord. They don't find Jesus anywhere near someone they should obey. But oh man, when I die, I'm going to heaven. Salvation is not automatic. You have to repent. You have to believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior, the boss who commands and tells you what to do, who has saved your life. Judas was held responsible for what he did, as will we all be. We all have a judgment day coming, all of us do. So can I remind you right now what a good time it is to get right with Jesus Christ. Wherever you're at, maybe you can make adjustments in your life to get right with Jesus Christ. Now Luke 22 and 24, they're still concerned who's going to be, who's, this started a mess. Luke 22, 24. Now there was also a dispute among them as to which one of them should be considered the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. But not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I'm among you as the one who serves." But you are those who have continued with me in my trials, and I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my Father bestowed one upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table in the kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. You know, isn't it just something how Jesus tells them a traitor is among them? Hey guys, a traitor is among you here. And then they all start arguing about which which one of them is the boss. There's a traitor here. All of a sudden they get in this squabble. I'm better than you. I'm better than you. I'm better than you. Isn't that something? Which one of them is best? You know, I'm a firm believer of what the Bible says, that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little bit of sin gets in there. It messes the whole group. It spreads fast. That's why repentance and forgiveness is such a big deal. It snuffs out the sin quickly. Especially among a body of believers when there's one guy in the room that comes in sinning willfully amongst a body of believers, it gets into everybody in a flash. I just noticed that. There's a traitor here who's going to betray me and now they're squabbling. Just like that. I mean, bam. Bam. That's why sin has to be dealt with quickly. Quickly. Jesus talked about if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Now I know he was speaking figuratively, but what he was trying to do, he was trying to give you an indication. Be as ruthless with sin as you have to, to get it out of your life. It doesn't hurt just you. It hurts the very ones you love that you say you'd never harm. Be ruthless about it. Get it out. Sin has to be dealt with quickly. You don't want it to damage the sinner as as well as everybody else around. And so Jesus tells them, a traitor's among them, they get in a debate with each other. Jesus told them that such things like this is like the pagans. When he said like the Gentiles, pagans do this stuff. Hey, quit acting like them is kind of what he was getting at. The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. The followers of Jesus should not think like this. Who is greater? Title. Rank, position. Don't we do that here in America? Especially in America. We do that pretty bad. And it all boils down to one thing. Selfish gain, doesn't it? Gain. Rather than wanting to be the greatest, Jesus' followers should want to be the one who serves others for their gain instead of serving self for self-gain. I've had people ask me before, Ray, how... Do you know if I'm living in a way that pleases God or not? How do I know if I'm living in such a manner that's pleasing to God? My question back to them is this. Are you striving for your own gain or or are you striving for others' gain? If everything you do is based on you being greater, if everything you do is based on you becoming greater, climbing up that ladder and becoming more awesome than you are, then yeah, you're not in God's will. You're in trouble. That's a good indicator right there. If what you do is for serving others in God's will, then you're probably doing pretty good. 
you're probably doing good. Now, I've had people over-spiritualize things when they consider maybe making a job change or a career move or something of that matter. Um, they ask me to pray that God will show them what to do. How, which way do I go with this, right? Will you pray for, that God will show me what to do? So then I ask them, is the change for you or is it for other people? Is it for you or other people? Meaning, is the job move for you to make more money for you to keep for yourself? To have more things and more stuff and bigger cars, better house and all the swimming pool, whatever? Is that what it's for? Is it for you? Or are you going into this move with the intention of being a representative of Jesus to whoever He places you with? If you move to a new job, you're going to get new co-workers, new people that you don't know. Are you going into that with the mindset, I've got the opportunity to represent Jesus to people I've never met that I would have never met any other way? The money is just a side thing. If you have that kind of a mentality about your life, God will give you the rest. Seek first this kingdom and I'll give you the rest of the stuff, he said. So I kind of communicate that to people. What's it about? Is it about you or, or, or others? Most of the time, the answer I get is that people are looking to move so they can make more money. More money, more money, more stuff. They don't tithe. They don't serve other people in any way. Their every angle in life is about how they can gain more stuff for themselves, for themselves, more stuff. Jesus said that lording over others, that's how pagans act. He said that's how unbelievers act. That's what he was saying to them when he says, you're acting like a bunch of pagans. Gentiles in this case is what he said. Jesus, the king of kings, if you think about it, the king of kings. He was among the disciples as, though, as one who serves in a lowly way. He served in a lowly way. You know, Jesus didn't ask somebody else to go to the cross. He went to the cross. He didn't come down, all right, now I'm God. I'm going to get the best of the best of the best of the best guy, the top pinnacle of all humanity that I can find. I'm going to have that guy go to the cross. Nobody could do it. No, nobody was sinless. Jesus went and did it. That's how far he got down for us. That's how far down he got in lowliness to serve us. And Jesus is telling them, you're, trying to, you're acting like pagans. You're acting like unbelievers. You're talking about who's better. He goes, I'm with you and I served you. That's how you're to be. So you go to your job place or whatever it is you do, go in there with the intention of representing Jesus Christ to them. Even that guy that pushes your buttons that you just can't stand. And I know there is one. Everybody has one of those. That one guy that just gets you. Serve that guy. Serve him. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about, right? Oh, yes, I do. I used to be quite a guy. Somebody, I mean, that you would not have liked if you'd have known me a long time ago. And when I got saved and I went in, I'm going to represent Jesus Christ. He put me with a co-worker that was exactly who I used to be. And he irritated me to death. I couldn't stand this guy. And God goes, that was you. So believe me, I do know. <laughs> I know. Jesus' disciples should desire to be like Jesus. Jesus. Servants. And you know, when you're a real servant, when somebody calls you a servant, let me rephrase that, you know you're a real servant when somebody talks to you like one and you're okay with it. You know what? He just talked down on me. Yeah. You're supposed to put yourself below them. You're supposed to serve them. Well, that was wrong for them to do it. Fine, that was wrong for them. Don't let it be wrong for you too. Be a servant. Be a servant. Luke 6, 31. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. The way you want people to treat you, you do it to them. And it doesn't say only after they do it to you first. It just says that's the way you're supposed to be. Jesus is telling these guys, it's not about who's greatest. Y'all need to stop that. That's like unbelievers there. You need to be about serving other people. And I can just hear it, and we're almost done. I can just hear it. people thinking, yeah, I will, as soon as they give me respect first. They respect me, then I'll respect them. Oh, that's just the American way of thinking, isn't it? You respect me first, then I'll respect you. That's not what he said. 
That's not what the Bible says. Do to others as you'd want them to do to you first. Especially if they don't deserve it. Especially if they don't deserve it. Why? Because we never deserved eternal life, did we? I've been marked for eternal salvation. I didn't deserve it. Why did Jesus give it to me? Because He loves me. And so if you're not willing to be a servant to other people, you don't love. And if you don't love, then what are you? Are you a disciple of Christ? Man, if you've got, you got the Holy Spirit in you, it's going to well up. That's what He said. You get the Holy Spirit, He comes up and He wells up like a fountain. You know, that old faithful geyser when it goes off once an hour or whatever in Yellowstone or wherever it's at, it just sprays it and just gets up and gets all over the place. You can't contain it. So when you go to work, just splatter all over everybody. Get the love of Jesus all over them. And you can't stop it. And it'll irritate them at first because it's so in opposition to the way they think. But eventually it'll come around they're like, what makes that guy so happy? You know, I had a guy come up to me. He goes, Ray, it doesn't matter what happens to you. When I used to work in the radio business, he goes, it doesn't matter what happens to you, Ray. You're always happy. I don't get it. it makes no sense. He didn't understand it. And he didn't like it. You're, su you're supposed to be angry. You're supposed to be mad. And finally, he got to the point of asking the question, whatever it is you got, I want to. And finally, I got to communicate the gospel message to him. So, I'm saved because Jesus paid a debt that I'd never be able to afford. I, I, I don't deserve it. I didn't have the, the currency to, to buy my own salvation. He paid that debt for me. And so, treating others the way Jesus treated me, that ought to be a small thing for us. You know how much you've been forgiven? You've been forgiven an eternity of condemnation. So if you've been forgiven an eternity of condemnation, what is it going to take for you to just forgive a coworker? You know what I mean? You'll be friends with him in five minutes. I'm talking eternity versus five minutes. Well, I worked around him for five years. Okay, eternity versus five years then. Jesus treated me like this. So I'm going to treat people like that. Even if they, especially if they don't deserve it. If this is something you can do without getting angry at others for it, um, I mean, if you get angry at others, other people for doing this, maybe you should review yourself. Maybe you should look yourself over and see where you really stand because Jesus said this is how Gentile pagans act. Don't be like them. Let me wrap it up real quick. Jesus told them in verse 28 that they will have places of honor in the kingdom because they were with Jesus in his trials. They will fellowship with him and sit on thrones, judging Israel's 12 tribes. Imagine hearing this. Imagine being there and hearing this. You just got done arguing about who's going to be best and the biggest and the most awesome. I'm better than you. And then he diffuses it, not by snapping and, you know, slamming a... Uh, a sledgehammer on your head, but he, he gives encouragement. I like this. Somebody wrongs you or does something that just irritates you, don't just slam them on the head. Encourage them. They probably need it. They probably don't get it from anybody. That's one way to serve them. So it, the way Jesus is answering them, he's serving them. He tells them, okay, let's diffuse that. Unbelievers act like that, but guess what? You're going to get this kingdom here. Now he's encouraging them. And it just diffused it right out, the argument. We can do the same thing, too. He's telling them, you've been given a kingdom in God's kingdom. That's an argument stopper right there. Wouldn't it do you that way? I would have loved to have been one of them guys. I bet that really put them back to the proper perspective. I mean, it would have me. So let's take this for a moment and look at ourselves. Salvation. Think about salvation in light of things that we strive for here. I saw a great uh, video. This guy had a rope. It was a really long rope. I don't know if you've seen it. This rope was really long, and it went off the stage and like under the door and gone. You couldn't see the end of it. And on the very tip of the rope, he had a little piece of tape wrapped around the end. On the very, very tip, but the rope just went off into who knows what. He said, this rope represents your existence. You will always be here. You will never cease to exist. You will always exist somewhere, whether it's going to be in heaven or in condemnation in hell. You're always going to exist somewhere. He goes, but this little piece of tape right here, he said, represents the life right now. And some people, that's all they think about. 
is this little piece of tape. And then he took the rope and he flung it around. You can see how long it is. You know, some people don't think about eternity for nothing. They think about this little, little piece right here. I went to visit a friend's grave the other day. And on his stone, it showed from this year to this year. And it was separated by a dash that long. That dash represented his entire life. That little dash, probably about an inch long. To think that your entire lifespan is represented in one inch on here on earth versus eternity. Can I ask you all to please think about things of eternity? Kind of let go of the what's going on down here. God's got a handle on that. You don't. You never did. You never will. Okay? <laughs> don't freak out that you can't get a hold of things. You're not, you're not intended to. Those things are built like that to get you to trust in the Lord so He can deal with it. That's why it's like that. Let it go. Go in prayer tonight. As a matter of fact, we're going to do that tonight. Pray for the Lord to take over. Repent of the sin of yourself trying to do it yourself. Stop thinking about that little piece on the tip. Stop thinking about just what's in that little one inch. You're, you've got an eternity somewhere. And if you want it to be in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ, you've got to start thinking like a servant. Because that's what Jesus is for us, a servant. He went to die on the cross. And praise God for that.